So community crime fighting, doing it with communities, working really closely with people because they've often got part of the picture. They will see things and understand some of the things going on that we might miss. So working with communities is critical. The precision is so you're kicking the right doors and you've got the right intelligence, the right access. So you're not, you're not just swamping an area and stopping everyone in the area. You're using intelligence saying, say, actually, that's the door we need to kick in. We don't need to upset that person. It's, the precision is really important. And how much is this down to the work and the help that's been provided by Professor Sherman, who was in this studio a couple of weeks ago? And I have to tell you a reaction from the listeners. Uh, sorry, just to reform, uh, this is a sort of a former Cambridge professor who's been recruited into policing. He was very keen. He's worked with some police departments in the US. He's, he's brought um, a different approach to what you and your colleagues do. Is that fair? He's doing that exactly. And he's got sort of a... a uh, he's almost like a one-man walking encyclopedia of all the best practice in policing in the Western world in the last 50 years. And, and sort of he's bringing his energy and his knowledge to help us in some of our tactics and some of our ideas, like the work we're doing on dangerous sex offenders. OK, before we take calls, finally, um, obviously great news for the people of Graham Park and surrounding areas. Come on, Commissioner, when will this be rolled into South London, West London, everywhere, East London, everywhere else? So we, we've done the analysis in terms of where those most dangerous um, ward clusters in London. Um, the first, we've got the first six areas we're going after. We're going to be announcing those in due course. And, and so I would imagine you don't want to tell me now for I'm, obvious I'm reasons. I'm not going to tell you now. So, so I have to ask, but you can't tell and, me. And then, so, and, and, and then as we, um, over the next um, few weeks, we'll be announcing uh, uh, our proposals for our neighbour policing programme and where we're going to be putting resources, because we're going to, ensure that everyone has a strong enabled policing across London. But rather than just doing an even spread on top of that, we're going to put some more intense resources okay. in certain places, like Graham Park, because we want to sustain that change and that quality of life for the people who deserve it. And no hostility displayed to your officers doing that. Everybody, Apart from the badens, everybody's on board. Every, everyone's on board. I mean, I've been, um, as part of our new Met for London plan, uh, over the last eight weeks, we've launched it in communities. We've done events in every borough in London. I've done 14 of them myself. You, right. Oh, sorry, 13. Tonight will be the 14th in Croydon and the final, final event. In those 32 events, all you get from the public is a sense that they want the police to succeed, they want us to do better, they want to work with us. Of course, there's, there's things they're frustrated about, they're angry about the stories they've heard, there's, there's, there's hard questions, but they want to work with us and they want us to succeed. All right, let's go to some of the calls. First up, uh, and make sure you can hear through your headphones, if yep. not, wave at me. Nick in Putney, you're through to Sir Mark. Go ahead with your question. Good morning. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Nick. So, Commissioner, I think I, I'm asking a question which most Londoners uh, have on their minds at the moment is, based on, you know, the acts of... Some officers in the Met, obviously Wayne Cousins, you've got Cliff Mitchell, and now these officers who have admitted to sending racist WhatsApps. What do you plan on doing to, re to reinstall trust in the Met from the British public in London? Commissioner. Uh, that's a, a great question. Thank you. So I think on the sort of trust side, um, three points I'd make. First, um, trust and confidence has fallen in the Met, absolutely. It's badly dented and we recognise that. Do we have a readout, a figure for it? It's, um, there's different stats. Um, sort of trust is in the um, high 60s. Confidence in local policing is, is around 50. It sort of varies month by month. Okay. Interestingly, we are on most of those numbers above average in terms of policing in the country and we're certainly higher than in most respects than the other big cities. But mm -hmm. that, that's not about being complacent. It needs to be a lot better. I think in terms of trust, there's two things to think about, and your question illustrates them both. What are the things we need to get rid of, and how do we need to work differently? The things we get rid of, I said in my um, first couple of weeks that um, we need to face up to the fact that there have been systemic failings which have allowed people to exist and behave in policing in the way they shouldn't. None of that takes anything away from the tens of thousands of fantastic men and women I have working for me, but there's hundreds who shouldn't be there, and we're working through that uh, with um, as great a pace as we can do, more investigations, um, more reports from their colleagues, because officers want these people out, uh, and we're sort of sacking and suspending people at a greater rate than before, and I've been pushing the Prime Minister and Home Secretary for changes in regulation. Well, you've got those changes, haven't you, last month? So, the, so, so they announced last week that they were going to do it. They will probably come in place in January and February, is, is the intent, and that will I've, um, we'll be putting some data out publicly in the next two weeks, and that will be, make very clear the the blockage in the system that is caused by these regulations that I can get... Um, can you give me numbers? Do, do you think you're halfway there in what you attain? 33%. Where are you? Um, uh, to break the back of this is two or three years' work. Um, and I've been in a year, so it's sort of... It, it, you're about a third of the way through. 
potentially. Sort and of, with the numbers as well of number of officers, again, is it roughly the gross total numbers that need investigation? Uh, well, I think uh, as I'll be able to sort of lay out, the um, the way the regulations works means that we've got more coming in the front end of the pipe in terms of investigations. We've got more cases ready to go for hearing. And whilst there's been big increases in the number of officers being dismissed for bad behaviour, there's a blockage at the hearing stage because of these bureaucratic processes. As that frees up, that big lump will be able to move through the system more quickly. But I, I think this is two or three years' work where, say, we get rid of those hundreds of officers who are letting everyone else down. High uh, hundreds? Uh, Mid hundreds? I'm not going to put pick a number out there. But it is it's, hundreds. Uh, it's hundreds. This is hundreds. Um, bear in mind, when I took over, the Met was um, only uh, uh, sacking sort of five officers a month on average um, in the previous years. And so we're talking about hundreds in a small number of years. So it's, it's, it's a big uptick to clear out some mistakes from history, which is um, embarrassing and frustrating and undermines public trust in the way that Nick said. But the other part of the question, so we need to take away the things that are undermining trust and... I have standards as one of my top priorities, more trust, less crime and high standards because of that. But then the building trust will partly come from things like the um, Grant Park Initiative. It's actually the quality of policing, how well we how well we answer the phone, how well we turn up to incidents and investigate crime, how we police your neighbourhood. All of those things matter as well. But we have to get rid of the, the um, standards problem. Have you noticed an increase in officers feeling confident to blow the whistle, to call out inappropriate or, if I may call absolutely. it... Absolutely. That has... A abso absolutely. Um, Again, you know I'm going to ask what sort of level. How, you know, can you quantify uh, it? So... Uh, in the first couple of months that we did an, uh, internal hotlines and things, I think the numbers doubled of officers coming forward with cases. That sort of come down a bit. You'd expect initial surge, yeah. but it's still higher than it still higher than it was. I think it's really important for me to say on behalf of the tens of thousands of good men and women in the Met, they're as angry. Uh, I was going to use a, a rude word. Then they're as angry about this as they're as angry about well, this as hacked off in a different way. They're as hacked off as everybody else as everybody else is. Um, they're up for stepping forward and reporting stuff. The thing they need the sign is that the bosses are up for following through. Because it, if, if you and I were work colleagues and you wanted to report me for bad behaviour, one of your calculations would be, are the bosses going to follow through? Otherwise, it's not worth me doing it. Absolutely. So our visible determination sorting this is one of the things that draws those reports through. We're speaking the day after five former Met officers who served in the same unit as the man who took the life of Sarah Everard have admitted sending racist jokes on the, the WhatsApp facility. We've done a bit of research, and even pro rata, Commissioner, it would appear that if I can just turn them all as rogue officers, whether they are involved in racist jokes, whether they're involved in even more serious crimes, they serve in a higher number in the Met than any other force in the land. What is it about the Met that attracts these sort of mostly men? I think you can uh, whether how, how you can do comparisons across the country I think is probably some slightly flaky maths but we have a serious issue I'm, I'm not sort of but is there uh, something was there something in the culture of the Met I think there's a lot in the systems uh, there's something some stuff in the culture that we have responsibility for in terms of um, leadership decisions culture not moving with the times I think there's some big issues for policing across the country in this you're seeing a smattering of cases elsewhere as well where because, for example, because we don't have a clear route to sack officers who fail revetting, which is one of the regulatory issues being fixed, systems fall into disrepute. And those changes to regulations where the Prime Minister and Home Secretary have been really helpful are going to be so important in helping to accelerate people out. Because something the listeners won't know, and no reason they should do, is that police officers aren't under normal employment law. No. They're under something called police regulations, and those are a bit more bureaucratic and restrictive, and that's why I need the manoeuvrability to get these things sorted. Lastly on this, before I come to the next caller, Yasmin, coming to you in a second, the five officers to whom I've referred were all in the Parliamentary and yes. Diplomatic Protection Command. You oversaw that command, didn't you? Yeah. The Assistant I, Commissioner Specialist Ops. When I was... Uh, had the Did cancer, you know these blokes? Um, I certainly didn't. When I, when I had the cancer terrorism portfolio, I had 10,000 people working for me across the country dealing with cancer terrorism, and part, part of that responsibility, a small part of it, was the protection of... Um, VIPs, royals, now, key, key I, buildings. I, I know I'm asking you to speak out former colleagues, but this is a unit described by Baroness Casey of Blackstock in her review as the dark corner of the force. You ran it. What's the problem there? 
so there are clearly a number of cases that have come out of there, but frankly, we've had cases come out of all, all parts of the Met. One of the big pieces of work we're doing now is about looking at our specialist areas like firearms commands, where people can stay a long time and making sure that we um, tackle these corners of bad culture. And again, I'm not going to sort of damn all our firearms officers in a conversation. That'd be wrong. And I know you wouldn't want me to either. But clearly, there are pockets in those areas that are too big and haven't been managed and led properly, and we're going to sort them out. Let's get to the calls. Yasmin's in Camden. Yasmin, you're through to the Commissioner. Go ahead. Good morning, Nathan. Good morning, Hello. Commissioner. Good morning, Yasmin. Good morning. My, no, my, my name is Yasmin, and yes. I work for, I'm a shop worker at Co-op, and I witness these horrendous shoplifting every day. So, Commissioner, my question to you is, why is shoplifting not seen as a serious crime? Well, let's put that. You may be aware that uh, Lord Rose, formerly Stuart Rose, said on this show earlier this week it has effectively been decriminalised. He is, of course, the chairman of Asda and he ran Marks and Spencers. So, Mark? Uh, it's, not, it's definitely not being decriminalised. There is a policing capacity challenge here, and I'm determined that we can get the capacity into providing a better response to incidents like this. I completely understand where Yasmin's coming from. This might seem a sort of tangential point, but at the moment, sort of 20 to 40 percent of our demand is responding to mental health calls. Now, um, starting to reduce that demand, which we're picking up on behalf of other agencies, is critical to give my officers the time to deal with criminals. Um, the, the balance of that effort has tipped towards policing being too, uh, uh, too much filling in gaps around sort of um, I know, social and welfare services and health services and not in therefore not having the time to fight crime. And whilst we then prioritise, of course, so I know rapes and stabbings will always get um, the, the, sub, the necessary response, that means less serious crimes like shoplifting sometimes haven't had the response that I would like them to have. I'm determined to sort those resource issues out so that we can do a better job for people like Yasmin. And we're also looking at technologies like live facial, uh, facial recognition, that, that my Sorry, how will that work? I, I the, go into a supermarket and I'm photographed as well, I go in. Well, no. no, more from the perspective of most shops have CCTV. Right. If we can use facial recognition to be have more rapid ways of identifying who the offenders were, it makes it easier to solve the cases and we can, with less effort, get through more cases and protect shops. OK. Uh, and just lastly on this, Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary of the Royal College of Policing, has talked about making following every possible crime. I sense that's a personal issue, then personnel issue currently for you. So, so they haven't got the blokes and women to do it. Uh, it's about forget, the, the the statement they made, which we completely agree with, is about reasonable lines of inquiry. Sort of, uh, and of course that varies based on the severity of the crime. What's reasonable in a murder case is different to what's reasonable in a shoplifting case. But there are some resource constraints, and it's up to us to organise ourselves better and squeeze more out and deal with these issues like the mental health calls and right. how we're organised so that we can do better. It's interesting. Thank you, Yasmin, because I think the next call is on the aspect of mental health. Uh, Fungi is in Enfield. You're on the radio. Good morning. Morning, Fonda. Good morning, Nick, and good morning, Commissioner. So, my name is Fungai, I'm a mental health consultant nurse, and I just wanted to find out, before making this policy, were mental health organisations consulted, and if so, are they happy with this? This is, To clarify, this is the policy where police officers won't necessarily attend at what's deemed to be a mental health uh, call-out. Is that, is that what you're saying, Fungai? Yeah, yes, oh, that okay. is OK, let's get the Commissioner involved. Yeah. Um, what, so, what is the policy, actually, uh, as you see it? I, I was going to go there first as I thought, well. Yeah, I could see in your eyes I got uh, it wrong. So, I think the, the most important thing to say is, if somebody is a, somebody else is at risk, if a mental health crisis is leading to a threat to somebody else, um, then of course we're going to turn up and deal with that immediate threat. So in the threats of violence in those situations in mental health crisis, of course you'd expect the police to turn up. But in the routine where somebody's in mental health crisis and somebody's worried about them, we're not the right resource. If that was a relative of mine, I'd want a mental health specialist, not a police officer who's being as compassionate as they can be, but that's not their professional skills. In terms of the consultation question, this has been discussed for over a decade. You can find reports going with, back... With mental health professionals? But yes, and there's been, there's been independent reports. Right. Um, Lord Adebowale did one, sort of, um, I think, 10 or 11 years ago. The Inspectorate of Policing and other services have looked at this issue. There have been multiple reports by coroners about actually policing being involved in this ca these cases being not ideal compared to mental health professionals, and so after ten years of after ten years of um, ten years of, de of debate, I've decided that we just need to get on and do it. And so I've frankly pushed the health service in saying we're going to get on and do it this year. Uh, there were some bumpy conversations at the start, but we've had some fantastic conversations since then with mental health with um, health and mental health leaders across London. And they have signed up to the plan. How do you know you don't need a man or woman, a, a cop there, Sir Mark? 
Um, it depends on the call, doesn't it? So, um, so it's down to the call handler, is it? To it's make down the to the call, call handler. So, so that policy. So, someone phones in. I'm worried about my. Um, I'm worried about my son. I think he's going into a bit of a mental health crisis. Um, that's really upsetting. Um, that's probably not the best use of uh, no. police officers. You want a mental health no. specialist. Um, my son's out on the streets. He's, he's in mental health crisis. He's a danger to other people. Yes, that's okay. for the police to turn. So, and have we got the backup? I know this isn't doesn't fall to you, but have we got the mental health teams that can help the one who says my son's in a terrible way? He's not going to hurt anybody. He's just going to hurt himself. Have we got the backup there? And so that's, that's why we've been having the conversation with the health services. This is about them um, discharging their existing policies and practices. The ambulance service are looking at what they can do differently. So that's all going on. Our training is taking place in in policing over the next um, couple of months, and we're going to go live with the first stage of this from the first of November. Jane's in Hayes. Your question, Jane, to the Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, um, Nick. Hello, Jane. Um, Good morning, Jane. Hello. Um, I live in the Uxbridge Hayes area and um, very affected by the ULEs. I absolutely think it's an unfair tax, yeah, taxation on us, etc. However, um, in the Uxbridge area, I haven't seen much damage to cameras, but elsewhere there is a lot of damage to cameras um, being pulled down, knocked down. Um, and I just wondered how much time you, you're, you're obviously hearing you speak this morning. have been doing some fantastic work in uh, with uh, your officers. Wondering how much time it's taking sorting out some of the damage and the the uh, crimes that have been done because of this tax that so many people absolutely hate in the London area. We can't get him on the politics of it, but we can get him on the policing of it and the fact that people are chopping down cameras, painting them, whatever it might be. So, yes. Mark? So, um, thanks for the question, Jane. Um, obviously, it's not for me to comment on what is a lawful policy, whether it's popular or not. It's for other people to decide, not for me. Policing must operate without fear or favour. There have been, in five months, so since the 1st of April till the end of August, um, 510 crimes uh, around damage and the like around these cameras. Um, we've arrested, I think, two or three people, I can't remember the exact number, in uh, relation to one um, large series of, of damage offences, and we've got other investigations ongoing. Uh, I mean, clearly this is this is uh, quite serious damage. It adds up to it's in terms of property, and that's the basis we judge it. So it is getting a... I guess a significant amount of policing resources, but clearly we're not going to. What's your message to people who want to chop down a um, ULES camera or paint over it or uh, whatever? Uh, we will. We're investigating the crimes, and we'll go after you, and we'll find you. But just in terms of Jane's question about prioritisation and the politics of this, that's why it's important that police chiefs, including the commissioner, are operation independent, and we're putting uh, the, the right amount of resources into this because of the severity and the volume. But clearly, that's. That's never going to come above, I know, serious crime, more serious crimes like stabbings or, or rapes. Or indeed knife, I would imagine. Trying a knife, to cut down exactly, on yeah. a knife crime. Exactly. Okay. I'm going to press pause on the calls because all my listeners will know and would want to know an update of what you can tell us about the hunt for the, uh, the fugitive, effectively, from Wandsworth Jail. Have you got any updates for us, Commissioner? Uh, so, uh, as you might have picked up in, uh, this morning, um, we have confirmed that sort of Richmond Park is one of the areas that we've been looking um, this is a massive operation, sort of um, well into three figures of officers involved. You'll have picked up as we're getting... Report. I hear 150, or it's been reported. Uh, 150, 150 in the core, core resources coming from counter-terrorism policing, um, but also there's help from forces around the country, there's border force helping. We've had sort of um, reports and bits of intelligence which have led to bits of activity in different forces, but at the moment um, we're still really keen to get any reports from the public. Have you seen, have you seen this man? Um, uh, don't don't approach him yourself. There's no information that says he's immediately dangerous, but don't approach him yourself. We will we will follow up. And secondly, you can see on our websites or news websites that we've released more details about the van that he escaped in. We know the journey that van took, and we would like any help you can offer in anything you saw odd about that van in South London, or South West London, because that might help us identify exactly where he jumped off, and that would be really useful for the investigation. So if you saw a van like that and something odd around it, then please respond to that appeal. One newspaper, The Times, reports that he came away from the van, detached himself or whatever, within around 200 yards. Can you confirm that? I'm not going to confirm that. You were told, not you personally, the Met were told about this at 8.15. That he was believed he made his escape around 7.50. From 8.15 until 3.30pm, that was when you made the public aware. That's too long a time, isn't it? Now, these things are fine judgments. There's a, there's a balance between... Not looking, wanting to panic the public, I get that. Uh, well, it's, it's, not, it's not about panicking the public. It, early, on in a, early on in a manhunt, you have got lines of inquiry, sort of you might have bits of intelligence, um, you're looking at sort of 
sometimes you're looking at things like um, phone data or um, uh, CCTV systems and things like that, where it looks like you might be able to get to uh, an answer very quickly. And focusing your efforts there is really important because once you open the phone lines, it, ge it can generate positive leads, but also it can generate a lot of noise of leads that turn out not to be useful. So getting that balance right is important. The other thing that's important to think about in terms of a public message is, is this person an immediate threat to the members of the public? If we thought he was about to go out immediately and and be a, an immediate threat to local communities, of course, that would have been a factor, but that's not a factor in this case. So okay. it's a finely balanced decision, but, it, the, but the fact it was done in six hours shows sort of how, um, how much we think the public would, might be able to help us on this case in identifying and finding him. Is it the Met's belief that it was impromptu or it was pre-planned? Uh, it's clearly pre-planned. I mean, he, so the, the fact he could, um, the fact he could strap himself onto the bottom of the wagon. I mean, there's obviously some logistics involved inside. Working. These straps were pre pre-made, were they? I'm not going to talk about the detail, but the fact that the, just to work out a prison escape and how you can do the logistics of it and get the right equipment and how you're going to do it is not is unlikely to be something you do on the spur of the moment. Can you confirm notebooks were found in his cell? I, I'm not going to go into that detail. detail you know, you I'll know keep that. going. And I understand. Can you give a comment on the possibility it might be an inside job, as it's called? So we're going to have to look at everything from uh, uh, as part of this investigation. Did he do this on his own? Did anyone inside the prison help him? Did anyone outside so the prison So that's a live investigation. It could uh, be an inside to, job. Did, so we, it's, a, it's a question. It, did anyone inside the prison help him? Other sort of other, other prisoners, um, uh, corrupt guard staff. Was he helped by people outside the uh, outside the walls, or was it simply um, uh, all of his own uh, all of his own creation? But the, I mean, this is really concerning. We've got somebody charged with terrorist and official secrets act offences. Um, who uh, that is uh, extremely concerning that he's now. Um, back on the loose, and um, we need to get hold of them as quickly as possible. So your view, your view, sorry, your well, listeners, no, they are viewing as well. your, your viewers, viewers and listeners, listeners, viewers and right. listeners yep. can help, particularly people who, who who may have seen things in South West London in the last um, last couple of days. It's worth reminding, of course, my listeners, you were in charge of counter terror for some four years, as I yes. recall. Um, how surprised were you that someone held on a charge like that was in a Category B jail? Um, uh, it seems odd to me on on sort of first inspection. I haven't dived into the details case, but it does seem odd that um, someone who's charged with terrorist offences and offences linked to undermining the state um, is not in the high security. But I have heard sort of Alex Chalk, the Lord Chancellor, sort of um, being very clear about commissioning an urgent review and um, looking at what lessons can be learned and how the prison service can operate differently. OK. And lastly on this, again, coming back to your counter-terror brief, uh, someone was detained on a railway station, who turned out obviously not to be the one, and the travellers on the train were told in the following announcement, we apologise for the delay, but police are apprehending a suspected terrorist on the platform. Should language be used like that on a train? Um, that if was... I'm elderly and I've got a dodgy heart, well, I am elderly, I haven't got a dodgy <laughs> heart, do I, do I need to hear that I might be looking out at a terrorist? Sir Mark? Um, that's not the best way of announcing sort of the tra there should be the train's been delayed um whilst police make some urgent inquiries and leave it at that until we get to, until you get to the end of it but um i'm not going to criticize a, a a train guard who's sort of probably under pressure and is slightly anxious but it's, it's it's unfortunate but i hope I'm, I'm sure everyone can understand people operating under pressure at speed sometimes say things in the wrong way melissa melissa is in shoreditch sorry melissa uh, you're through to the commissioner good morning to you Hello, good morning, Nick. Good morning, Commissioner nice. Rowley. I'm a little bit nervous. But I'm trying, I'll try to do my best. But I'd like your help, Commissioner, because I have a great uh, concern for what's happening in our neighbourhood. Um, a little over two weeks ago, uh, my husband and I received an email from our neighbour who received a message directly from um, the area council, Tower Hamlet, and uh, the Metropolitan Police in regards to the use of they want to install live facial recognition cameras in our neighborhood to address issues of antisocial behavior. Now, in our area, for many years, we've made complaints to the police, the Metropolitan Police, about requests of having regular patrols from Thursday to Sunday. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to move you to your question. Melissa, can I move I'm you to your question? Um, yeah, thank how, you, sorry. How can they have live facial recognition without authorization from the public? Right. Um, because we feel that it's a, a problem against our liberty. Okay. We want them to be policing, but we would prefer to have 
and um, for, for the police to listen to our requests about having extra patrols or having people okay. out. Instead of cameras. Melissa, please don't think I was... It's just, uh, so many people want to speak. Um, now, policing experts say this is game-changing technology. Other people say it's Orwellian. What is it in your view, Sir Mark, these cameras? Um, so I, I don't know the details of how Hamlet's thing, but if Melissa wants to leave some details... I will uh, sort we, that out we, we, yeah, I, right I, now. I'll get that followed up. In terms of the general thing, it's... Uh, like all technology, it's about how you use it. We've been very careful over the last couple of years in picking the right um, facial recognition technology, getting it independently evaluated by the National Physical Laboratory, and now we're starting to deploy it in different operations. I'm not sure whether this is a case in, in point in, in Town Hamlets. The sort of things we've looked at is, is it accurate? Is it biased? And so checking all the data. We are already getting some extraordinary arrests. There are um, already a small number of... Um, uh, Serious, I can think of one, a serious wanted offender and linked to organised crime. Sex, drugs, what, what are we talking um, uh, about? Drugs, who's drugs. been, who's been um, on his toes, wanted for 10, 10, 12 years, who we would never have arrested him without a live facial recognition camera spotting him on one of our policing operations. Um, likewise, that was in, in one of these in London, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and we're starting to look at it with um, image, still images from scenes of crimes as well, and um, it's... So he's now facing him. charges, is he? Yes, exactly. Yeah, he, he, he was wanted for charges. He'd skipped bail. He was on a warrant for, for a decade, and we've see. now got him. And we're starting to see some signs of catching rapists and murderers. The important thing, I think, for a member of the public, if we're using it live in the streets, you have nothing to worry about. All that's in the camera is the photos of wanted people and people like that. So it's not everyone's photo. If you walked past that camera, Nick, if you walked past it. The camera will, like, for a millisecond, grab an image of your face, work out whether you're wanted, and when you're not, it deletes it straight away. So your face is in that data for, a, for sort of a millisecond in the system, and then it's thrown away. If you compare that to the amount of footage captured of you walking down the streets by CCTV from shops and councils and all the rest of it, it's a minuscule intrusion. All we're looking for is sort of wanted and other dangerous people. All right, one final. We asked as you were coming in for people to give questions during TikTok. This is the final question. This came via TikTok, so everybody knows we take ones. Carl says, I have a child who serves in the Metropolitan Police. When is the commissioner going to do something about the Notting Hill Carnival? He was on he was on patrol there, and I'm very worried about his safety if he's assigned to the Carnival in future, Samar. Uh, Notting Hill. Actually, you spoke about this this week, didn't you? I City, have, Hall. Uh, City Hall. So, Notting Hill Carnival, um, three things I want to say about it. Firstly, there are hundreds of thousands of people go there and have a great time, and there's a fantastic event in many respects. But I have, from a policing perspective, I have two concerns. It's not the volume of crime, which is not disproportionate. You said if, if you work into football matches, it's almost on a par. But on a par. The but volume of crime, the level, it's but the severity of, of the crime yeah. is really concerning. The number of weapons, I think we recovered 71 knives, um, one or two firearms. Um, we arrested over 300 people, which again, it's not but, the number, but the severity in there of stabbings and, and, and then uh, 69 assaults on police officers. Well, this is, I mean, you had one police officer who was sexually assaulted. Six of your colleagues it's were more sexually bitten. assaulted than that, I think. Was it? Okay, six we were reportedly were bitten. Last year there were also sexual assault on police officers. The Met Police Federation saying this is becoming unsustainable. So you're, this, you're putting your blokes and women, you always do, but you're in known harm's way here, Sir Mark. Uh, so it's not my event to organise. So we're, we're doing a review. And there's, so the other risk I wanted to mention is risk of crowd crushing, which is not our responsibility, but we end up having to sort of try and manage that um, when the stewarding and other arrangements fail. So we're doing that review work. I know as part of that we'll be saying we're really concerned about the severity of crime, as I've said, um, and also the, the crowd crushing. And we'll be asking the organisers, Notting Hill Carnival Limited and local authorities and others, to think about the arrangements to get rid of those really worrying risks so that the sort of... Do you mean the closed streets when you say the, the, for the, the safety of the, the carnival goers? You, is that where the crushing could take yeah, place? Exactly, yes. And, so, and it's not all through the carnival, but you get crushes at certain moments um, where things happen, perhaps near but, a particular soundstage. But wouldn't it be safer to put it in a park in a controlled environment such as that? That's for, that's for the organisers. There's many things you could do about how it's run, how it's organised, how it's stewarded. I sense um, you wouldn't oppose the idea of putting it in a park in a controlled environment. I don't want to enter into other people's responsibilities, but my responsibility is fundamentally policing. I am worried about, not the volume, as I've said, but the severity of that crime, the stabbings, the weapons, etc. There's some things we can do with... And the men who serve, women who serve under you, of course. I, I completely. I sort of, and it's, and I mean, the public would expect it and the, and my colleagues would absolutely expect it. And it's, it's 
deeply unpleasant some of the experiences that some of them have had. So that's why I'm going to push hard with the organisers and and those who um, are surrounding this, like local authorities, for for improvements that deal with these risks, but enable hundreds of thousands of people to keep enjoying themselves. Great seeing you. Well done on the work you and your colleagues have done, as you say. The fact that mums and dads can send their kids out to play up in Graham Park and hopefully other parts of London. It's a great is story, isn't it? Puts joy in your heart, doesn't it? It's fantastic. Makes you work, makes work uh, pulling the uniform I mean, on. Uh, so <laughs> people, come, people come into policing because it's interesting and because you can make a difference. And when you get feedback like that, that is just the best, isn't it? It's better than any number or any statistic. That, wo- that woman's quote about my kids can now play outside is just spectacular. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming by the LBC studios. It's 8.33. News headlines are next. The head of the Metropolitan Police has told Nick that officers are carrying out an intelligence-led search for Daniel Khalif in Richmond Park. Sir Mark Rowley says the terror suspect escape from HMP Wandsworth was clearly pre-planned. Sir Mark has also told Nick he's around a third of the way through efforts to clean up the force. He says the Met has gone from sacking five officers a month to hundreds over a relatively short period. Figures seen by LBC show it's cost around half a million pounds for an asylum barge in Dorset to sit empty for a month. The 39 people on board the Bibby Stockholm had to be removed from the vessel because of the discovery of Legionella bacteria. LBC weather, most places will have another dry day with lots of hot sunshine, a few thundery showers in the north and west, a high of 32 degrees. This is LBC.